Good morning, Arise Miami. We're so happy that you're here to worship with us today. Whether you're on YouTube or here live, it was wet, soggy, but it's still a glorious day. You believe that? Sing with us today. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my dream till I met you. I was breathing, but not alive. All my failures I tried. It was my dream Till I met you You called my name My soul Hallelujah, hallelujah Now your freedom is all that I know The only I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my happy to be here yeah it's gonna be an awesome day today we have so many announcements we're gonna get to that right now but before we do that are these guys here do i do that now or he's on frank's oh. good good morning good morning everybody welcome to arise i hope everybody is uh dry i know we all oh, some of us weathered some monsoons to get here but let me tell you, God is shining here today, so welcome. My name is Francisco Ramirez. I get the privilege of welcoming you here. So welcome to returning members. 
You know, I know it might have been a tough week for some of you, because some of you guys might have celebrated. Whatever you're going through, we want to make sure you guys are here at an oasis that's just restful, peaceful. You're going to open your minds. Welcome to new visitors that are here today. Everybody is hopefully that you understand one of our big things is once you come through the doors, your family, so it's not a first time thing, it's an always thing, you guys come back. We have some commercials, some announcements here today. We always like to talk about our texting. Um, our texting service is basically how you get plugged in, right? You have a question um, about anything, you can, you can text. One of the big things here is about prayer. Um, how many of us need prayer, right? I know I need prayer during the week. I need help about um, maybe my finances, maybe some relational things, but whatever it is, we always can use prayer. So if you have anything that's heavy on your heart, use the texting service. It's very easy. Just use that number, you QR, QR code, and you'll get somebody to, to pray for you. Next thing is, we like to talk about life groups. Life groups is the lifeblood of Arise. Let me tell you, if you're not in a life group, you are shortchanging yourself. Reason why is, life is not meant to be done alone, right? Life's tough enough. Can you imagine being in the corner trying to do life by yourself? No. God didn't create us that way. God created us to be with like-minded people, sharing what our struggles are, sharing what our wins are, and the best way to do that is with life groups. There's no perfect people in there. It's a confident, confidential setting, and it's just with a lot of people that love or wanting to know God and just sharing your, their same journey, which leads me to the journey. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me, okay, I guess I'll go into uh, Glory House. If, if you saw, we have a basket out front for Glory House. Glory House is something that we're helping raise money and some gift baskets for Easter for basically victims of human trafficking. It's very serious thing, folks. It is something that, um, it is a big business. It's an evilness that's in our world today and we take it very serious. So any of our part that we can do, if you guys wanna give in the local, um, uh, local service and, and offerings, you can give that way. Or if you wanna donate something, today's the last weekend that we get to donate, and then they'll put the, the, the Easter baskets together for Glory House. But this won't be the last time, we'll do some other events with Glory House. But just guys, just know that we're, it, it's a big initiative, you guys can help with that. Agape Feast, next Friday. Next Friday, we have the Agape Feast. Guys, this is where we get to come together and share just like in the Bible times. Get to get together and break bread, literally break bread with each other, right? And share about our communion, our life with Jesus, and just get together. What an amazing time. The picture in your mind, a big, long communal table or a table where you get to see people. This is beautiful as it is on Saturday, but imagine eating when we have food in the center of that and then Jesus on that. So if you can make it next uh, Friday and the time is at 7.30, we'd love to have you. If you have any questions, always just text. And then um, I'm gonna talk about giving. Um, I might have missed the journey, and I don't want to. I'm gonna make sure I don't miss the journey here, guys. Sorry. No, the journey. I'm sorry about this, guys. The journey. We just do this four-part series. It's about the why you were created, right? The what you were created. God created each and every one of us very, very uniquely, and most of us, or a lot of us, have asked ourselves, "Why am I here?" What am I doing on this planet? What's my purpose? What's my big thing here in life? Let me tell you, the journey with the lens of God and how he created you is gonna help you understand that better. We do that every beginning of the month, and it's a four-part series, four levels. We just got done with level four, and let me tell you, it was amazing. Some people that have come here from backgrounds of all different sorts, right? So if you guys have not done the journey, I'm telling you, please do it. If not, you're gonna shortchange yourself. There's always an opportunity to join in. And that's one of the big takeaways I want you guys to please just use the QR code for that. So last thing is about giving. Um, we like to ask for tithes and offerings, right? Not because Arise needs it. Yes, we need it, but we're blessed in so many different ways, not just by the giving here, but in so many other things by our community leaders, by the people that are contributing their time, 
But giving is really about Jesus asking about you're committed to him and how you can give not just generosity, but your gratitude. It's about you saying, God, you have blessed me in this one department. You've blessed me in my health. You've blessed me in my finances. You've blessed me with relationship. Whatever it is, I wanna give back to you what you've given to me. So it's a faithful act. So if you can, just text, use that for giving. Um, and you can also go on the website if you wanna go that way. Last thing, I'm gonna read, let all that I am praise the Lord with my whole heart. I will praise his holy name. So let's pray our heads. If I can get everyone to stand while I pray and we can open our minds and our hearts as we begin our experience with Jesus this morning. Our Father, which art in heaven, Lord, thank you so much. Thank you so much for bringing everyone here, even the ones that are online watching. It is a true testament, God, about we need you. You know, we might have gone through the rain, but we're willing to go so much further with you because it's the best journey. It's the only way, God. Open our hearts, open our minds. Let the visitors be here that are here today. Let they, if they don't know anything about them, let them understand how great you are, what you want for us is the best. And bless the pastor, bless the sermon here, bless everybody here on the committee and on the worship team. And I pray to God that you, um, Watch over us as we leave here today also. In your name I pray, God. Amen. I want to invite Reggie and Kobe to come up here. Um, I just found out a couple of minutes ago that Reggie and Kobe are headed to Dominican Republic to play professional basketball in DR. And I didn't want them to leave without us praying over them. But you mentioned to me that you want to do something special in DR. Can you share that with your church family? Because we don't know when you're going to be back, if you're going to be back, yeah. but we know that God has done something special in your lives and it arise. Tell it, tell me, tell, tell them what you told me. So one thing we asked God for was to allow us to play professionally, but most importantly, if he allowed us to do so, we would glorify him in everything we do. So what we've been constantly talking about is every game or every chance we get, let's say they put the camera on our face, we want to let everyone know why we play, right? And why we're even able to, to get on the court and play basketball. And that's because of Jesus Christ, because he gives us the opportunity to do so. And that's exactly what we, what we wanna do. Glorify him every game we have by not only just saying the things like praise God and all of that, but actually living it out on the basketball court, right? And being those, the, the light on the basketball court. Because if you play sports, a lot of things can get a little aggressive. You can lose yourself mentally and say things that you shouldn't be saying. But we want to not only say godly things, but live a godly life even on the basketball court. So that's our plan. Amen. Patrick, why don't you, yes, let's give Jesus a round of applause. <clears throat> Join me here and just uh, embrace Reggie and Kobe with me to pray for them. Lord, thank you for the faith journey that we've been able to witness and testify in Kobe and Reggie's life. But Father, today we're sending them out as missionaries. We're asking that your Holy Spirit cover them, that as they leave Miami and head out in the next couple of days, we're not sure when we're gonna see them. You've already determined when that is. But my prayer is that your Holy Spirit may cover them, always protect them from harm. May the blood of Jesus be on the doorpost of their heart and that they may be disciple makers wherever you send them, Lord. That the lights, that the applause may never ever shake their faith or cause them to stumble. May they remain humble serving humanity in everything they do with the love of Jesus in their hearts. We consecrate them now to the mission you've chosen for them. In Jesus' name, amen.
We invite you guys to worship with us now. It's an amazing God we serve. And even if we're running away, he's running after us. Amen? You ever feel like you're a prodigal? And you feel like you need to run back to God? Well, God's always running after you. Believe that.
Every time I turn around, you keep blowing my mind. Yeah, every time, every time I turn around, you keep blowing my mind. But every time, every time I turn around, you keep blowing my mind. Every time, every time I turn around. And every time you fall down, he's there to pick you up. Amen. We want to believe that today. We want to believe these words today. Because God is here in the presence. We have to glorify him in everything that we do. And don't worry about anything else because he will pick you up. today church can we live our live each day without saying hallelujah to our God Almighty amen because he's our living hope our living hope that's all around us we need to declare that today with one voice can we do that today arise if you're here today just lift up your voice lift it up to him now and give him the glory
tempting to turn away from his loving embrace. But time and again in scripture, we see God relentlessly pursuing his lost children. 
Over the next few weeks, we'll explore this theme through the prophet Jonah's drama-filled escape attempt. We'll see Jonah flee God's call, only to be swallowed by calamity. Yet even in the belly of despair, God rescues him. In his anger, Jonah learns that God's compassion extends to all. Even there in the pit, God's passionate love finds us. Join us as we reflect on God's relentless pursuit of the lost. No matter how far we wander, he calls us home. There is no shadow dark enough to hide us from his compassion. Let us answer by turning our hearts wholly to him. Passion. Why run from a compassionate God? Good morning. Good morning, Arise family. Buenos dias. All right. Sapase. Guaguan. I don't know. What else? What other language? Bonjour. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a rainy day, right? So there's a few seats empty, but it's all right because there's people. You guys are watching us online. You know, for those that live up north, when it snows, everybody's like, oh, I don't think I should drive. For us Floridians, when it rains, we're like, oh, I don't think I should drive. So a lot of probably people stayed home. And if you're watching us online, we welcome you to our Rise family this morning as we open up God's word. But before we do that, I just want to say, everybody, just stand up. Let's stand up. And look at your left or your right. Just welcome somebody and just let them know, it's so good to see you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. We are glad you're here. It's good, right? Feel good? All right, you may be seated. <laughs> Feel good. It's good to see some familiar faces, um, visitors, first time guests with us. Muchos que están visitando. Ya saben, el amor que tengo por muchos de ustedes. And it's, it's just good to be together here to worship God. Amen. We're about to hear his word. We're about to just dive in to the series that we've had. And we were just so blessed to have uh, Pastor Roger Hernandez last week broke down um, Jonah chapter 3 for us in such a, a, a powerful and re relevant way for us to understand. And the week before that, Pastor Kendall, we've just been on this journey with, with this book of Jonah. And this morning, we're going to go into chapter 4. But before we do that, I just want to... I just want to ask for the presence of God here. And before we do that, I have that prayer. Um, Jonah chapter 4 is a very interesting chapter. It's about to close the whole, the whole book. So I want to just to read uh, Jonah chapter 3 verse 10 before we jump into chapter 4 so it makes sense. And uh, we've been talking about, hold on, where, where are we going? Here we go. We've been talking about focused faith, and we're about to realize how focused Jonah should have been. So I just want to read Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. If you have your Bibles, or if not, you can just read it with me. This is what happens before we jump into chapter 4. It said, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So let us pray. Father God, this is your word. We didn't write this. You've inspired the generations, God, your word to come alive. And as we open it, we believe that you speak, for you are the living word. I pray, O oh Jesus, that you be with my mind, with my heart, with my spirit, with my lips. Anoint them with your power and your strength, O oh Father God, so that together we may hear from you. Together we may love you. Together we may walk out of here and we may say, after it's all done, that we met with Jesus Christ today. In his name I pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. It's interesting for those of us that preach, like Pastor Kendall, Pastor Roger was here, anybody has ever preached. The ultimate goal of preaching when God gives you a message, the ultimate joy is to see people come in repentance, right? Come in repentance, surrender their lives to God, understand that God is compassionate and loving, and see their lives change. That's the goal. Like, 
for everything that we do here, it's not just a show. It's not for you to just listen to songs or whatever, even the preaching. The goal is for you to encounter Jesus Christ and for your life to be completely changed. But in Jonah chapter 4, we're going to go there today. Look what happens. Jonah chapter 4 verse 1, it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Now remember, we just read chapter 3, the last verse. It said that God relented on, and then he was like, you know, I'm not going to do what I said I was going to do. Jonah is ticked off that God didn't do what he was supposed to do for Jonah. He says, that's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. So now we're starting to understand why he fled. For I knew, this is what Jonah knew. That you are a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Look what verse 3 says. Therefore now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah is pissed because he actually was effective. Think about this for a second. Can you imagine doing a good job and being pissed that you did a good job? It's like, how does this make sense? Most prophets in the Bible, whenever they went somewhere, they were actually killed. Nobody wanted to hear their message. Even Jesus, the greatest of all, comes in. Nobody wanted to hear his message. At first they liked him, but then they crucified him. So everybody in Scripture that we know of as prophets... They were in love in their own community. They were rejected. They were stoned. Jonah is the one of the few that he goes and does what a prophet does. And everybody says, okay, we'll do it. We'll change. And he's actually ticked off that he got the results that every prophet wants. Why? Because God sometimes has more problems with his own people than a whole nation of pagans. God sometimes has to work through us and, and we're like sometimes very reluctant. And sometimes he has more problems with us than the people out there. Jonah actually wanted his enemies to be wiped out. Jonah's plan in preaching was... I want them dead. God gave me a word so that you guys don't have an opportunity. You are our enemies. Thank God he gave me this word so I could go tell you that God is upset with you. And then hopefully you all die. Like Pastor Roger said last week, he's like, you die, you die. He wanted everybody to die. And Jonah's mad because he cannot control this outcome. The people surrendered, and he can't control this. So what we find out is that Jonah's mad. He can't control the outcome, and Jonah's actually feeling entitled. Whenever you feel entitled in your life, because you know what entitlement is, is you feel like, I deserve whatever this is, or I did this myself. What we typically lack when we're entitled is gratitude. Gratitude tells us, I don't deserve this. I don't, I don't even know how I got here. I don't even know how I got this job. Entitlement tells you, I studied hard. I got the test. Come from a lineage of very smart people. It's, you know, it's my buddy. He helped me out. Gratitude says, I'm just grateful for the people that got me here. Jonah is not in anywhere near the gratitude part. He's on the spectrum of entitlement. Jonah was given grace multiple times. God tells him, you know, hey, he's in the boat. He could have drowned. He doesn't. God takes a fish, swallows him up, and then spits him out on this land. Jonah should have had a lot of opportunities to realize, man, God has been so gracious with me. But he couldn't focus on gratitude. He didn't have any focused faith. He's focused on his own desires and his wants. Jonah wanted every person that he disliked to die. His pressure 
was towards judgment. You ever felt the pressure of those people that send you a text message is like, if you don't send this to 20 people, like, I, I, I dislike when I get those messages. Like, God loves you, he cares for you, and if you don't send this to 20 people, like, the pressure, right? There are times when we think that we can actually control God. That I'm God's elect, I'm God's favorite child, and he will do exactly as I think he should do. And I want to tell you this morning, you got to be very careful when you think that you're the elite, that God is somewhere like you're the most special one. The story of Joseph is Joseph sharing that and then his brother's like selling him off. But what can we learn from this? There's a saying that says that we are great lawyers for ourselves, but amazing judges when it comes to other sins. We tend to be great lawyers for ourselves, but then great judges for other sins. Jonah says here, was this not what I said when I was still home? Jonah knew, man, God is gracious. God is compassionate. God is loving. This is what I know. But I don't want him to be loving and compassionate to these people. Because he was afraid that they would repent. And it actually happened. And he wanted God to judge these pagans. This morning, we're not going to go through, because we've been roasting Jonah for the last couple of weeks, right? Jonah shows us he has a lot of issues. But I want to take us to this journey of saying, hey, you know what? As we follow Christ, we also have a lot of issues. We sometimes feel entitled. We can know that God is compa compassionate, loving, kind. And it all sounds good in practice until God tells you, okay, these are the people that I want you to be compassionate and loving to. Entitlement is a trap because you start to think that maybe God has to do exactly what you have in your mind. I sometimes talk to people and, they, and, and I, as other believers, as you journey along the, the journey of faith, right? And sometimes I, I hear the, the, this statement, my Jesus would never, is it your Jesus? You know, my God would never, is it your God? Do you have enough power to put your mind and say, God is not going to do this because I don't think God should do that. And Jonah here is enjoying the mercies of God. Jonah's being, mer God is merciful with him. He's compassionate with him. He's enjoying all the benefits of God, but he doesn't want to give him out. He's enjoying every good gift that comes from God. Mercy, kindness, compassion. God is not dealing with him harshly. And he's receiving all that. He's enjoying it. But when it comes time to give it, he doesn't want to give it. Which leads us to this. Would I want God to treat me the way I treat others? Would I want God to treat me the way I treat others? Sometimes we all want the mercy of God for us. But the real test of a believer is, do you want what you receive for others? God, as you're merciful with me, extend the mercy towards my neighbor. God, as you're compassionate and loving with me, help me be compassionate towards those around me. Do you want what God has given you for others? That's the real test. Or are you just loving that God is giving you all these blessings and all this compassion and all this mercy, but you're not willing to give it to others. Jonah goes to Nineveh, and he starts preaching about God's wrath. But we just read that Jonah knew something, right? He knew that God was compassionate, loving, kind, gracious. He knew that. 
God tells them, go tell them that I've seen their wickedness. And Jonah says, I know you're loving. I know you're compassionate. But I'm just going to preach about the wrath of God. And he forgets to give them that part. Jonah didn't speak about anything else except judgment. But he didn't give them a solution. He could have said, guys, but you know what? God is loving, compassionate. If you turn, he will accept you. I was speeding one time through Alligator Alley. I was like going to Tampa, wife is sleeping, the baby's sleeping. I'm like going real fast through Alligator Alley on my way to Tampa. And all of a sudden, like these cops hide on every little bridge. And there was a cop there hiding. And I'm like, woo, and I see, woo, lights turn on. And I'm like, ah, and there was like three of us speeding. Because I'm like, if they're speeding, I'm going to speed. And then we're all going to speed and we're all good. And as I'm flying through, I see the cop comes in, and then I'm like, oh, man, he's, he's blaring. He's coming from the back. The lights are on. I'm like, oh, man, he's going to bust me. It was me. It was me. I know. I was going like 90. And then all of a sudden, he gets behind me, and I'm like, oh, man. And then he goes, woo, and then he goes away. And I'm like, yes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, God. Oh, my goodness. You're so, you're so merciful. And then I see he starts pulling the, uh, a person that wasn't even in our trio. And instead of me saying, like, God, thank you, I was like, bro, it wasn't even you. It was me. This is Jonah. This is us. Where we're like, man, God, thank you so much. I didn't get pulled over. And then you're like, ah, you got pulled over. It so happens that sometimes we want God's mercy, but we don't want to give it to others. Jonah's so angry that God has given them grace. Like, this is crazy if you really think about it. Jonah's so angry that they got grace that he's like, I want to die. I want to die because these people got grace. And since they didn't die, because he wanted them to die, he says, and then I want to die. I wanted them to die, but since they're not dying, just take me. I want to die. And God asks him a question because God wants to reason with us. That question was, let me see if the back button works on this thing. Oh, guess not. God asks him a question of, like, why are, you, why are you angry? Do you do well by being angry? Why does God ask questions? Because God wants us to be honest with him. He wants to take us through the journey, and, and we see that through Scripture when, when we find uh, the story of Cain and, and Abel, and Cain murders his brother, and and the first question that God asked him is not like, hey, bro, I, I, you killed your brother. No, he says, where is your brother? So that Cain could, like, think. And he's asking this to Jonah as well. He asked Adam and Eve in the fall. He's like, who told you you were naked? God is about asking questions. The Bible says that God it says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. But the first part, God is saying, I want to talk to you about something. Let's talk about this. Because in hopes that as you're talking with God, you will come to your senses and you realize that sometimes you're not looking at things too clearly. So Jonah gets asked a question. And part of Jonah wanting to die was because he also knew that as a prophet, if you prophesied incorrectly, what happens to false prophets? They would get stoned. Couldn't go back. Jonah's like, man, I can't wait that if I tell these people, I'm going out, I'm, I'm in this tribe of Judah, this people of Israel, and God is telling me, I'm going to go to our enemies. And he gave me a word to the enemies, and they're going to die, and I'm going to go out there. And then he's like, well, I don't want to go out there because those are God's enemies because he's gracious and kind, man. So if I preach on that and he does the thing that I'm not supposed, they're going to think I'm a false prophet. Jonah's like, I, if I go over there, I, I wish I could just come back and tell, guys, guess what? I got rid of all our enemies. And they would have been happy. But if I go back and I say, guys, I went to preach and our enemies, 
They're doing better than we are. They didn't want that. He would rather die than come back and share the good news of God's love, patience, kindness. And God is so patient with Jonah that instead of just dropping on him like judgment, he goes into like, I love my son. Let me give him an object lesson. And this is where we go in Jonah chapter 4, verse 5 through 9. It says, Jonah went out of the city. He sat on the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant. And made it come over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die again and said, it's better for me to die than to live. Verse 9. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry enough to die. Jonah goes out to the city. Like, check this out. He's like, I gave the message. Wrath is coming. Judgment. I can't wait to see you guys die. He goes out into the city. He sits down and he's waiting. Like, this is like a view for him. He's like, I can't wait to see the fireballs come down. I'm going to see he sits down, and then God puts a little plant or shade for his view. Front row seat to destruction. Are you the type of person that is waiting for others to fail so that you can prove to yourself that what you said was right about them? Are you the type of person that you say, hey, you know what, don't go this way, and then you're actually wanting them to fail so that you can then say, I told you so? Are you wanting to look at people's lives and whatever perception you have about their lives or the judgments that you made, are you actually wanting that to happen so that you can say, you know what, I knew it? As a parent sometimes, right, you got to be careful with your kids. You're like, no haga eso. And you're like, ojalá haga eso para que el Dios le diga. Que no haga eso. Para que entienda. Right? You're like, don't do that. And sometimes, you know, as a parent, you're like, just, I, I wish you would. Do it. Because then I'm going to show you why I told you not to do it. That's in parenting. But sometimes it spills over into, into our lives. Right? Be careful of your trip. I told you so you would trip. And we as human beings, we sometimes expect these outcomes because it's like justifies us. Like, I can justify my truth that when I see you fail, I can say I knew it. And this is Jonah. And this is us. And the root of this is a pride. It's an evil that we have. That even though we know God, even though Jonah knows God, He's there with this prideful attitude and he's not willing to share what the compassion and love of God with others. Here's a question for you. Because as I also talk around with people, I am always hearing, man, this world is messed up. And sometimes as believers, like the sin of the world shocks us. We're always shocked. When if there's anybody that should not be shocked, it's us. Because we know how this story goes, right? But every time we hear something bad happen or, or somebody in the faith that falls or, or the evil that is happening in the world, it's like, oh, it shocks us. The thing that should be shocking us in reality is the grace of God that God doesn't strike people down. If there's anything that should shock us is the mercy and grace of God and and Jonah is not shocked by that. He's actually shocked by the evil, and he wants them to die. God prepares a plant so he can have some shade. And after all this time that Jonah's angry, this is the first time we see that he's happy. 
He's like, a, sh a plant, shade. It says there that Jonah was happy, like, wow, I'm in the shade now. He loves the benefits of God, but for no one else except him. He's not wanting for God to shade the Syrian people. He wants the shade. He, he didn't even make this plant, and he's like, oh, this is comfortable. <laughs> Thank you. It's what I deserve, because I'm here to watch them all die. He loves the benefits of God, but just for himself. God prepares a fish to swallow him. Now God prepares a plant, and all of this is God's grace, and he's prepping all this to prepare Jonah, and God does the same with us. He's always prepping us to understand the deep truths of what the Bible is teaching us. Because although Jonah knew about God, he only had theories in his mind. And many of us read the Bible and we see God as this, as this being that loves us and cares for us, but I'm gonna, here to tell you, sometimes it's just a theory. You, it hasn't been tested. The tests of life are the ones that prove what we read and the experience then starts to validate whether God has says who he says or not, right? And Jonah knew in theory God is compassionate and loving and kind, but his life is showing that in reality, that's just a theory of Jonah. You have not experienced it because it's not showing up in your life. The Bible says that Satan knows the word of God. Satan knows the word of God, but he can't apply it. Satan knows the word of God, but the Bible says that he knows it, but to have the revelation of Scripture, you need the Spirit of God. So he reads the Bible and he doesn't understand it because you need to have the Spirit to have revelation. My question is, are we reading the Bible like Satan reads it or are we experiencing it? Do we have the revelation? Because to have the revelation, you need to have the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is humility, kindness, mercy, knowing that you don't deserve it. And then the revelation comes and then you go, wow, the thing that I've received, I want others to have. But to get there, God sometimes has to prepare us. You want to be used by God? You need to be broken by God. You want revelation? God has to break us. I'm going to share with you a picture here. It's a picture of my daughter, Aria. Many of you know her. And I was walking with her one day at a park and... The day was really hot. And she kept on walking and until she figured out, and I'm walking behind her, you know, as her father. And I'm walking behind her. And she was in the heat. And then she looked at my shadow. And she realized, in the shadow, I don't get the heat. So I'm walking with her and I would move to the right and then she would go to the right. I would move to the left and she would go to the left. And I'm like, Wow, this is such an amazing lesson of our experience with God. And I took a shot of it. Because my daughter figured out that if she walks in the shadow of her father, the sun won't hit her. She realized that as long, even though I don't see my dad, I see his shadow. If I remain in the shadow, I won't get scorched by the sun. Jonah could have been grateful to be in the shade. But God had to remove the shadow because he wasn't even grateful for the shadow. Aria was grateful for the shadow. She could have preached to Noah and Jonah and Abraham. And all these people said, I understand what faith is in your father. And this was such a beautiful picture to me because I was like, you know what? When you're in the shadow, you're safe in God. When, when you're in the shadow of his, of his arms and, and of his wings, you're safe in him. But when you step out, you're going to get a little bit burned. The sun exposes us. S-U-N, sun, hot, hurts. S-O-N, the sun 
exposes us. When we step out and it gets hot, then we're really going to see what we're made of. Jonah was in the shade, and then the moment the sun comes in, God wanted to still address. He's like, man, Jonah's happy right now, but I'm going to still show Jonah where his heart really is. Remove the shade. Now Jonah's like, ah. Now I'm so angry again. I want to die. God's like, you see, man? You see, Jonah? As much as God is having this mercy and kindness against the Ninevites, God is working through this man. And this man is a man of God. Whenever we feel angry, resentful, bitter, the best thing you can do is practice gratitude. Every single one of us goes through life circumstances that will just upset you. Whatever that is, like my daughter, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe, like, I, I need to go to sleep and she's keeping us up. When you, when you pause and you say gratitude, what does gratitude say? God is like, wow, I can't believe I have a healthy daughter. Gratitude. Wow, I can't believe there's a kid in this house crying when there's parents that wish they had a kid in their house crying. Gratitude. I can't believe I'm stuck in this traffic. Gratitude says, I can't believe I have a car to go to work. I can't believe these kids just made a mess in the house. Gratitude says, I can't believe I have five kids. I can't believe, oh my gosh, this boss of mine is like so, oh my goodness. And they don't even pay me enough. Gratitude says, I can't believe I get a paycheck when others are wishing they had a job. Oh my goodness, this husband of mine. Oh my goodness, this wife of mine. Gratitude says, I can't believe I've been blessed with a spouse. He's so mad, he's not willing to accept what is happening to him. He accepts the shade, but he does not accept the sun. When Jonah could have just said, man, I'm grateful for both. Jonah could have just said, you know what? I had a little moment in the shade. Thank you, God. But he says, I'd rather die. Look what verse 10 to 11 says as we almost come to a close. The Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, the great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from the left and also much their cattle. Not only did God save the people, he saved their animals. So my question this morning or afternoon, this is already 1220, how can we find value in such small things like a plant and not find value in people that are made in the image of God? How can we find value in our vehicle or in our houses, but we walk by people that are made in the image of God and we reject them? God is telling Jonah here, how could you, how could you value this plant that you didn't even make? I made it, and you value this more than 120,000 people that didn't know their right from their left. They were lost, Jonah. God is a relational God, and he could have just quit on Jonah, but he wants him to understand the heart of God. I remember one day when I had really had an experience with God, it was June 2014, and it like, it's like all of us, right? When we, we surrender our lives to God, we're excited, right? You feel like, man, I, I'm... I'm healed, I'm restored, now I have God in my life, this is amazing, and this journey is so beautiful, and then all of a sudden, you have to be careful because now you're on the winning team, and then you're like, I wish everybody had this too, they're on the wrong team, I'm on the winning team. 
And I remember I'm here where, where I was lost, broken, and as time goes on, God has to deal with our pride and our ego because it's all in us. Every single sin comes from pride. Every single circumstance, but God would destroy nations because of their pride. And we have it, even though we've surrendered our lives to God. There's a, there's a famous author, Pastor Pete Scazzaro, says, God, Jesus is in your heart, but Grandpa is in your bones. What does he mean by that? He's saying that although God is in your life, there's still areas that God wants to address. Don't get it twisted. You're excited. You're, you're in this journey. You decided to walk in this path with God. It feels amazing. It's a broad road at first, but then it starts to get narrow because God wants to address a lot of issues that we have. He's patient. And I remember as I'm going through this experience and now all of a sudden you start like you're on the winning team and you feel a little bit prideful and you want to start sharing your faith and, and you're like beating everybody up. And God reminded me one day, it's like in my spirit, it's like God spoke and it was like, Abner, when you were lost, when you were broken, when you were out there twerking in the club, there was people that were already saved. There was people that were praying a lot more than you were praying at the time that you were lost. I was already doing a, mil a million and one things. I was patient and kind and loving and merciful with you. You didn't experience it or find something new. This has been all along. I've just offered you grace. I was like, wow. And it's us at times where we have it so twisted that we think we have the grace of God, but we don't want it extended to others. That spirit is the spirit of the Pharisee. That spirit is a spirit of self-preservation. As Jesus was dealing with the sick, as Jesus is dealing with the outcasts, as Jesus is coming outside, because people say, you know, Jesus was out in the streets dealing with all these people. Yes, as Jesus is dealing with all these people, outcasts, sinners, all these things, he was also in the temple dealing with the Pharisees. Both sides. The ones outside are saying, I don't know if I could be forgiven. I don't know if God loves me. The ones on the inside are saying, I know God loves me. I know God is with me. And God is dealing with both because both have a heart condition. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And there's so much subtleties in our pride. I'm gonna share a subtlety with you that maybe you all can relate. This is a subtlety. Look how it sounds. Man, this world is getting bad. Jesus needs to return and everybody says amen but you know what that subtlety says that subtlety is saying this world is so evil I want God to return so that I can be saved you see what it sounds like when you really look at it my question as believers in the second coming of Jesus why do you want Jesus to return it's the question I always ask do you want him to return so that you could just be saved and whisked off and look back and see the world destroyed? Or are you wondering, God, hold on, wait up. When people tell me, I want Jesus to return, I say, I don't want Jesus to return yet. Because when Jesus returns, that means his wrath is coming. And my neighbor could perish. And my co-worker could perish. And I'm saying, God, wait, relent. In the same way you had mercy for me, God, just wait a little bit. There's many people that don't know you there's many people that you know understand the love of God and it's the subtlety of our pride as believers sometimes yes we all want Jesus to return but the question is why do you love him so much that you can't experience life without him or are you wanting self-preservation because you're like I can't stand this or it's so disgusting all these people suck man I just need to get out of here this was Jonah and look what God did God corrected Jonah's lack of compassion by clarifying his love and compassion. In scripture, as I close, God shows us how flawed we are. He shows how flawed prophets are. 
he shows how flawed pastors and preachers are. He shows how flawed his people are. And he's showing us all these flaws, not so that we can focus on Jonah. He's showing us all these flaws so that we can focus on him. So that you don't love the creation more than the creator. And he shows us all these things because we, we love to follow people. And God is saying like, you're following that guy and that guy might fail you. I as a pastor might fail you. Your pastor might fail you. Your, 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 your friends, your loved ones might fail you. And God allows these failures so he can say, keep your eyes on me. I will never fail you. There's so much that he could have done. So much that Jonah could have done right, right? We all agree as we've been on this journey with him. But that's not the point. The point is what God can do. Look what Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, as I close today. Let me go back. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, says the following. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Who for the joy that was set before him. Jesus is saying, I have this joy that I'm looking at. And that joy is so much that I'm willing to endure the cross. You know what the joy of God is? Do you know what the joy of Jesus is? You know why Jesus is going to the cross? Jesus is saying that my greatest joy is this, that I'm about to open the opportunity for anyone who believes to be saved. The greatest thing that pleases God is when a sinner turns. God is not interested in so much wrath. He's interested in people turning. If there's anything that turns on God, if there's anything that gets God excited is when he sees a person who's broken and says, God, I don't want to live this way anymore. And then he says, compassion, love, and mercy. And as he turns, all of heaven rejoices. Maybe you this morning are saying, you know what, man, I don't feel that. Who lied to you? Because God is merciful, patient, and kind. He's actually more excited to forgive you than you are to forgive yourself. He's actually more desperate to love you than you to love him. He's actually more willing to do the impossible than you feel that you have to do. So my question to you this morning, anyone this morning, do you believe it? To believe it, you lower the pride you bring in the humility, and then you start to see grace. You move aside your ego and you say, God, I'm going to remember you in the days of my youth. God remembers you. He wants to do so much in our lives now, not later, right now, right now. You might say, it's not that serious, bro. Abner, it's not that serious. It is serious. You know why it's serious? That we have been given grace and we can offer grace to others and that you actually have something to give others of grace and mercy and love and kindness and let them know that God is willing to do the impossible in their lives from your coworkers to your loved ones. You know how serious it is? This is how serious it is. I had a friend who was out there lost and the only person he wanted to hang out during a period of life that he was going through problems was me and he would call me Abner can we get together and I was like yeah we'll get together well don't worry Abner can we play basketball and I was like yeah I'll, I'll, I'll go but I, I just have a lot of things going on hey man can we play basketball this week no I, I'm busy hey can we play basketball next week no I'm busy hey you want to go out to eat no no I, uh, let's try next week. This is how serious it is. Because eventually one day I get a call from another friend that says, hey, you know what happened to our friend? He's dead. And every inch of me was like, what? This is how serious it is. 
he died. And I felt this overwhelming guilt and it was like God was like saying, Abner, you had every opportunity to share with this young man and you didn't. You were too busy. You were too in your, in your own journey when the world is dying. When there's so many Ninevites that need to know who God is. And I vowed that day, I said, God, I will never let that happen again. Because it is this serious where God has given us so much grace, so much kindness, so much mercy. And there's people dying around us, people that are willing. There's Ninevites around us that wish they would hear just the message of God. That wish they would just see a smile in your face. That wish they would get an encouragement and let them know that, hey, whatever you're going through, God loves you and I'm here for you. That's how serious it is. Or do you want to just sit here, receive, hoard it, go on in your way and be a Jonah. I pray this morning as we close that you ponder on this. God, as I leave this place, where is my heart? Because God's question is, where are you? What are you doing? How does your heart look? And that you say, God, I, I want to be in a place of compassion and mercy for others that's you this morning raise your hand if you're saying God you know what I want to experience that with our hands raised I just want to say God here we are father we don't know how to do this we don't even know some of us are like I don't even know how to smile teach us father have compassion and mercy show it to us in our face so that we know how to give it to others father Bless us this morning, God. Continue showering us with blessing upon blessing. But even when you come to correct us, Father, that we may be enough, humble enough to not be like Jonah, but to be like Christ, to endure the cross because of the joy to see others come into the promise. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand and let's finish the service today. Thank you.
This is for us right now. Acts 9:18. Immediately, something like scale fell from Saul's eyes and my eyes and everyone's eyes here. And he could see again, and we could see again. We're gonna have the guys here come in with Patrick. And you guys are the head, so you lead us. Lead us how it's supposed to be into this confession to our Savior and to our King who's going to make us whole again. Here I stand high and surrender I need you now Hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out Here I stand High and surrender, I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever, my soul cries out. Here I stand, high and surrender, I need you now. Hold my heart now and forever, my soul. now father we woke up today and it was raining 
But even if we complain, God, we know somebody was praying for rain. Somebody needed rain. Help us to be grateful, God, that your grace is what holds us even right now. Help us have hearts of gratitude, God, for everything that you've done for us. And that an outflow of the grace that we receive, God, it may outflow and pour on to others. As we start this week, God, when we have continence, God, and a spirit of grace for others, that when we encounter people, God, they may see the love of God, that it may not just be here in this place, God, that we praise you, but that we may praise you when we move out, when we're sent out into a world that is lost, but has the opportunity to be found. You want to use us, God. You want to use us. You could do the impossible. You could do this all yourself. But as you wanted Jonah to understand and you wanted to the Ninevites to understand, you want to use us so that we can be involved, so that we can know that the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac is a compassionate God, a merciful God, and that we can extend that to others that need to know that. If we don't know that today, God, move in our lives so that we may be convicted and we may know you as the God that you say you are. And that lives may be changed by every single person here, God, everyone here in attendance, that as we walk out of here, we may be filled by your grace, but we may extend grace to others. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, guys, on Friday we have our amazing, amazing Easter celebration for the Washington Communion. Hope you're there. But until that day, we're going to sing about the glory.